Welcome again to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. It is the end of 2018. <sighs> Thank you. And we're going to recap today. We're going to look at some things that have been on our on our minds, on our uh, consciousness. And um, I take a look back and a look forward. Emily's going to come in and uh, she's going to tell you all about the rest of the show. Hi, everybody. Uh- Good to be back. Happy holidays and wishing you a happy new year going into 2019. And this has been a really interesting year for, for everyone that I've talked to, all the people, you know, for Randy and I, certainly as individuals and, and as a team for the people that we've, you know, had the pleasure of talking to both as guests and people who are supporters and listeners and patrons and whatnot. And this has been a year full of struggles and growth and comedy and tragedy and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it has really. But it's been a a really big year and we want to thank all of you, you know, uh, for sticking with us through some (laughs) interesting terrain here and to uh, all of our patrons and listeners and friends. And uh, we really appreciate all of you. And um, yeah, like Randy said, we're going to take a look back. We're maybe, you know, chat about some of our favorite shows of the year and just some of the things that were the hot topics and take a, a deep look into what 2019 may, may bring and where we want to, where we want to take, it, where we want to direct it. And so here to do that is our most frequent guest and our good friend and confidant, Robert Phoenix, to lend us uh, his opinion on this stuff, but also his astrological uh, knowledge and uh, let us know where we're going. Robert Phoenix, welcome back to the last show of 2018 on Off Planet Radio. Hey, I feel uh, really great about being here and honored too, because you guys have so many people that you can pick and choose from. You know, such a wide variety of people that come on your show. So thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Of course. It's a yeah. no-brainer. <laughs> I think, I think um, the synergy of what we do, the three of us, is kind of interesting. You and Emily obviously do you know, kind of a, a weekly, bi-weekly or something, some regularity commentary show. but. Um, the astrological side of it and Robert your decoding of um, the occult things going on out there is is just terrific I enjoy reading it and watching it so it's good to have you back right on let's tap into our synergy yeah yeah um, where do we want to go Emily let's let's start with you Randy so let's just kind of like you know 2018 was a really interesting year, you know what I mean? Like, let's just kind of start with, you know, how it was for us as, you know, a little bit personally, but also people who are in the, the media space and whatever, and we can kind of all sort of see, you know, like, let's talk about our sort of, how we sort of see this year, and then we can maybe reflect a little bit on some of the shows and stories of the year. <clears throat> you know, I actually consider this year my personal tra- travels and trials were kind of a mirror image of um, the alt media. This is a year that a lot of things melted down. Um, alternative media, from my perspective, is gone. It's either been absorbed into the microcosm of this mainstream kind of slick, smarmy type of media, or it's going completely batshit crazy and, and bounced off of the walls and knocked itself out. But you know, when I look at the alternative media this year, I, I just see complete free fall meltdown. And that was kind of, it's an interesting parallel. It's been that kind of year for me of kind of falling apart and then putting it all back together again. Yeah, it's been an interesting year. Like for me, just, you know, mm, I've allowed a lot of new things into my life this year that, you know, had sort of been off limits for me before. And there's been a tremendous amount of growth and freedom in that. And then, you know, my struggles with um, technology and and media in general 
you know, sort of continue, which is really a funny position to be in, considering that I'm a co-host of a, you know, fairly successful podcast here, and I love doing it, and I love my interactions with the guests and with you, Randy and Robert, and 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 with the listeners and whatnot. And my strong, but you know, it's been sort of a fight because my stronger desire is to have these interactions in person, and you know, I've been almost completely absent from Facebook for the entire year. Um, which every time I get on just for a few minutes, I understand why I'm absent from Facebook, but it also, you know, makes it difficult to, to, to do some of this when you're kind of not wanting to be involved in social media. And then the same thing, you know, I, I'm listening to very little stuff anymore. Like I listen to a little bit of news, you know, sort of newsy kind of stuff, just so I can have some idea what's going on in the world because I'm still, you know, exist in it. Um, but the, a lot of the kind of information I used to consume in terms of, esoteric information and podcasts and whatever, I'm consuming very little of it. Like I just don't get some of the pleasure and joy and, and whatever it is out of it anymore. Every once in a while, it'll be something that's still titillating to me. But this year for me has really been more about taking all of these, this information that we've gathered over the last, I mean, for me more than a decade and really like starting to pay attention to what that actually means for me internally. And that's been kind of an interesting process and maybe one that, you know, in the new year, and I know you've been doing a lot of internal work, both of you as well, but maybe one that we start to bring some of that discussion of what this actually means internally, instead of just all of this external discussion uh, into the fold next year. Um, but yeah, it's been, you know, it's been a challenge. Well, you know, and I think we always have done that in very subtle ways. More, and, more, more overt now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's going to become more overt. You, you know, it's interesting, you have this really aversion to technology for most of the year, which frankly, you know, it, it created problems in, in some sense that, yeah. you know, we rely on, on, on the digital media format. And I, on the other hand, am totally promiscuous, but <laughs> it wasn't lost on me that the balance in that was, you know, you needed to find your balance in that and I needed to somewhat temper and moderate my own immersion into the digital media. And it's kind of like what I was saying earlier about the bipolarity of alt media right now. Uh, we're just, we're kind of seeing a free fall. You know, people were falling off. Other people were, are, are going balls deep now into what I consider to be the repackaging and rebranding of esoteric conspiracy UFO type material. It's almost like now we're getting uh, a zip zip file that you unpack and, and, and it's like somebody downloaded all the secrets of the universe and here it is on YouTube for free and you're kind of going, nah, it doesn't really work that way. But it's interesting how when you, when you step back and you look at your own personal journey a lot of time, it so heavily parallels the universe that you kind of exist in. And this is the universe that we exist in, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Robert, how is 2018 for you, both sort of, you know, personally and, and, and in terms of your media presence and then where that area where the two sort of overlap? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a, a really interesting question. And uh, what I uh, wanted to uh, kind of uh, echo with Randy is that alternative media is not just in a free fall, but I, I really think it's kind of dead right now. I mean, totally. clearly there are plenty of numbers uh, that suggest otherwise. You go into YouTube channels and see that there will be, you know, 40,000, 100,000 views or um, a lot of different subject matter ranging from, you know, anything that's going on with Trump to, what's going on with Saturn to what's going on with the secret space program to, you know, what happened 40,000 years ago. I mean, you know, there's uh, the, the YouTube has become kind of a de facto mystery school in some way. Ah. Mm. And, uh, I, and, and it feels to me like I've always been somebody who just wants to go in the other direction uh -huh. because there's so much oversaturation now and it's good and it's bad because the floodgates have opened. There's plenty of information out there. Um, I don't think there's a ton of great filters out there. Um, and I think that a lot of people are really hungry and starved for the truth because, you know, what we witnessed in 2018 was the birth of the QAnon phenomenon. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, God. And, you know, that started in October. Of 2017, yeah. 2017, right. But 2018 was when QAnon really took off. And we're still talking about it, right? I guess we're still I talking about QAnon. And I, and I think that QAnon points to a lot of what Randy is talking about. I mean, there's more to it than just QAnon. I mean, we saw sort of like these people who have sort of staked out the alt-right territory uh, move into their, you know, kind of little black box world. You know the Dave Rubens and the Jordan Petersons and the Sam yeah, Harris. They're not. They're not really all right. They're more just like sort of. Me. Well, I think I think some people would have pegged them as alt right at one. I point. mean, most people don't actually understand what the alt right really is. So it's the alt light, maybe like what people perceive alt-right, as the alt right. Yeah. yeah, and then you have people like Cernovich and Posobiec, who are these you know Twitter wonders uh. when Trump was getting elected. And, you know, now they're completely repositioning themselves to the center, and they were never really alt-right. You know, people who understood kind of what that meant. I mean, when I think of alt-right, I think of people like Henrik Palmgren, right? That guy's well, an alt-right. Richard Spencer, Jared Taylor, these people are alt-right. What most people don't understand about what the alt-right really is, is Dave Rubin and Milo Yiannopoulos and all those people could never be part of the alt-right because the alt-right is anti-Jewish. Right. And these people, Dave Rubin, Milo Yiannopoulos, all those people, they're pro-Israel. So the and most I, of them happen to be Jewish. I mean, let's right, right. So I think that there's been a deliberate um a deliberate attempt to paint those people as alt-right, the Dave Rubin types and whatever, because they don't want people to actually listen to any of the, the, the some of the fair point. I mean, I'm not into any of the alt-right stuff. I don't, I'm not racist. You know, I'm not, a white, I'm not looking for an ethno state or I don't like any of that stuff, but they do have some fair points about Israel, right. And, and about, um, you know, Zionism and Judy, you know, you know, certain aspects of Jewish people, and certainly not all Jewish people. There's plenty of wonderful Jewish people, including people in Israel who fight against their own government's nonsense. Yep. Um, but they don't actually want people to understand what the real alt-right is because then they'd have to look at the JQ, right? And so, um, you know, I think there's been a deliberate, a deliberate smearing of, of the, 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 the border between uh, being sort of center-right libertarian and alt-right, right? Or something See, like and, that. And this is where, this is actually, again, a mirror of the, the culture at large right now, which is highly polarizing and stratifying. You're being pushed all the time to basically pick a team, pick a position, uh-huh. pick a label. And in fact, um, that's how they identify you now. It goes into this whole hashtag thing, you know, of being able to filter information because AI wants to know. You know, ultimately, we're, we're sorting bin for AI right now to continue targeting and demographizing. Is that a word? It is now. Demographizing um, everything about us on the stratum from politi- politics, sexuality, uh, your preferences in food, your preferences in style, all of that stuff is being categorized and sorted and tossed back mm-hmm. out into the cyber world. And then you get to vote again and you vote over and over and over again. And it is really a sorting mechanism uh-huh. and a way to keep people in, in a readily identifiable sorting bin. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, told, I totally agree with that. And, you know, uh, the NSA, you know, somewhere in Utah has massive profiles on everybody. It's our, our virtual strongman. The NSA and just Google and Facebook, right? Yeah, and all, like, the, all the, NSA is, the NSA is running the big program, right? Yeah. I mean, and they're grabbing information from Google and Facebook, anywhere they can get it. And uh, they create these virtual strawmen so that, our predilections and our habits yep. can be identified at any moment in time uh-huh. so that if we you know, move into that realm of a person of interest, um, everything is predictable about us and they know exactly to their, to their best ability what, they're going, what we're going to do, right? Uh-huh. Based on all the keywords and all the data dumps and all the processing. So everybody's got a virtual straw man. There's another one of us that exists yeah. in the virtual realm. Um, we hit the oversaturation point. 
I mean, that's what it feels like. I feel like we're at the, and I think Randy's made, said this term before, like we're at the end of information. Like at this point, we're just like getting different versions of the same. It's very, very rare anymore that like I hear somebody talking about something that hasn't already been talked about. Maybe they're t telling a little different version of the story or it's a different sort of uh, angle on it or whatever. But I remember like it used to be that like I just couldn't get enough because there was so much information out there and, and so much new stuff. And like, I just feel like, there's nothing new under the sun. And so like, it, it, I mean, on a certain level, and this is not about me thinking I know everything. The truth of the matter is that there's not a lot of new stuff out there. Well, right, it, but like the, this but, isn't about- but, that, but I think we're living, I, I, I agree with you, Emily, but I think we're living in a hermetically kind of sealed totally. pod. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people out there that mm -hmm. have not been down the rabbit hole. Yeah. And that's why it took off like a right. wildfire. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, they count on the fact that, uh, to use the crude marketing term, there's fresh meat every day. Yeah, so and by the time but, but, the people who are constantly now coming in and reuptaking all of this information that any of us that have been in that movement for a decade or more. We just already, we're just at, when QAnon came along, we were all just at eye roll. You know what I mean? It was just like, oh God, really? You know what I mean? Like, it, but, you know, and there's some people. The, the part that's been confusing to me is there's people who I would consider to be you know, not people that we necessarily know as colleagues, people who've certainly been in this game as longer or longer than we have, who seemingly have fallen for the QAnon. That's the mm -hmm. part that's most, or maybe it's just because that narrative goes along with what they've hoped would happen. And so like they're at the end of their rope and they're out of hope and the hopium comes along and they get another hit to keep them going for another year. I'm thinking of one person in particular, but um, so that's been the part that's been most confounding about this or most confusing. But yes, I agree with you. Like it's just, by the time QAnon came along, it was, I mean, I love that eye roll emoji, right? You know, the eye roll emoji. That was kind of like my complete inner reaction when I first heard the term QAnon and what that was about, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Robert, I know you remember this, the emergence of this in the late nineties and a time when it was actually kind of a thrill to go listen to Alex Jones and Oh, yeah. It was actually, you know, I mean, at that point in time, first off, the internet had not been mediated yet successfully. And we still had outlier things like shortwave radio and things like that that were propagating what you would call the underground information. The, what's really happened is, and I'm curious to know what both of your perspectives are, is the underground dead or has it been driven so far underground that it seemingly does not have visibility anymore? Or has it been absorbed? I think it's been absorbed. I mean, if you look around at popular culture and you look at commercials and you have Taco Bell doing Illuminati commercials, <laughs> you know, I mean, how much more absorbed can you get than that? So and I, I, know it's, I know it's very superficial, but you can, I mean, just look at, you know, shows like, you know, Mr. Robot, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. And it's just, you know, it, it's just become, we, we've literally been absorbed, uh, kind of co-opted into this weird mishmash of tinfoil conspiracy, you know, kind of, you know, cliches. But at the same time, everywhere you turn on TV, pretty much it's there and available. Um, so we're living in this really kind of weird place. And I know we, we've talked about this before, which is like, you know, the, the revelation of the method and the externalization hierarchy, which are two different things. One comes out of the esoteric world of Mana Blavatska, and the other comes out of kind of this um, you know, definition of we're gonna give you some truth or what you think is the truth. Uh -huh. And you'll kind of get into it and you'll feel it, but it's really, it's really just a, it's just a taste. It's not really the whole thing. And so we're swimming in this melange of it now. Uh -huh. And in some ways, like there, it, I feel like it's this beast that's been unleashed and they're just trying to kind of control it and move people around and redirect people and, you know, kind of herd people. I mean, Jordan Peterson, is a really interesting example. Can we talk about it for just, because this Please. was Jordan Peterson's year. Yeah. Right? This was his I mean, He's been year. around for a couple of years, but he went, he went huge this year, yeah. He was significant, and I'll tell you how significant he is. <clears throat> he went from being 
<coughs> excuse me, this kind of, you know, emblematic kind of, you know, warrior <laughs> sort of priest for the alt-right, for young men on the alt-right. Wow, we found our dad. Here's our dad. We love our dad. He's talking straight to us. He's interesting. Yeah, I'll go make my bed. You know, this was the kind of image that young men had been craving for. And I, and, and I think that that's very true, by the way. But he went from that kind of, you know, sort of Pied Piper into a much broader kind of cultural um, spokesman and icon. And I had a conversation with a, a Facebook friend yesterday, and she got Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Living. Uh -huh. And she's, life, of, life, you know, yeah. she's slightly religious. Um, she's in a recovery program, and, and she couldn't wait to get into it, right? So Jordan Peterson went from being this guy that takes on a feminist, you know, in a BBC interview, which really put his stake in the ground, to by the end of the year be appealing to women, uh -huh. right? And really fascinating kind of transformation. So you, you drill down and, like, who is Jordan Peterson? And who does he hang out with? Well, he hangs out with all your, you know, Sam Harris and uh -huh. Dave Rubin and all those cats. But then you go even further into Jordan Peterson, and you find out that he's, he's done work for Agenda 21. Well, right? you also, and this was my, the first time that I really spoke at length about Jordan Peterson. I think I spoke about it maybe even with Michael Joseph on, on his podcast. The, the truth of the matter is, is that, Jordan Peterson comes from McGill University, which was where much of the MKUltra activity exactly. first occurred, right? right? Yep. And so, like, what are we looking at here? There is a 100% for sure, a lot of what he says is true and right and valuable. But what is, what is the agenda be, be behind him blossoming at this time period, right? Like, what is going yeah. on here? And I, I will admit to you, I, I, it's getting harder and harder now, but I've been thinking about it since he first, when he first broke on talking about you know, the compelled use of pronoun, pronouns and as far as addressing transgenderism and stuff like that. Like, from that time till now, I've, I've wanted to interview him because I want to ask him what he knows about mind control and, and if he is aware that, that, you know, like, I do think there's a part of him, a large part of him that is very earnest. I've watched him get very emotional in interviews. I've seen him live. I, I think that like he's doing a, a largely a good job, but there is something lurking in him, lurking under him, lurking behind him that I would like to understand the nature of, and I wonder how much he even understands about it. Right? Good luck. Good luck at getting to that. By the way, <laughs> I, I, I think yeah, I that's think why I know, because asked, that's but... woven into the undercurrent of the culture anyway. They're not right. going to talk about that. But, so. so I think he's endemic of what we're talking about with this revelation of the method. Like mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson is that guy. He well, gives people truth on some level they can resonate with. Well, it feels good. It's like you're getting a he, he really does both things. organic meal. But then he's going out and working for UNESCO and Agenda 21, and he's got some other stuff going on in his background. It makes you kind of go, wow, what's really going on with this guy, right? Right. Well, he does both things. He does that thing that you're, so like, I think what you were saying before is like the, the kind of information that's out there is either your Madame Blavatsky stuff that is too esoteric and confusing for most people to understand. So it's okay to put it out there because most people aren't going to understand it. And then as far as the information that is explained in plain English so people can understand, it's just a taste or just light or missing all the big stuff. Well, Jordan Peterson does both things. If you go listen to some of his, uh, lectures on orthodoxy or postmodernism and stuff like that some of that stuff is really really heady and di and he's telling he's giving a lot of information there but it's in language that is difficult for most average people to understand and then when he's talking about these things that are more like in, in a sense that are easier to understand in plain English he is only giving he, he's not getting into all the really nitty-gritty he's just giving the light over the, the sugar on top part right like the dusting the yeah, well, he's a Gemini. So, so he, he does both. You know, yes. He's Hermes. Yes. He travels between worlds. Yeah. And he's a trickster. And I think beholden to no one in some ways, right? Uh -huh. He's beholden to Jordan Peterson and whoever's going to pay him. Uh, that's my sense. Uh -huh. So you're going you're gonna to get you're gonna get everything that you talked about in one yeah. package with him. Uh-huh.
Well, so you have some people who now all they do, that's the only information that they take in is stuff that Jordan Peterson and his intellectual dark web buddies talk about. There's people that are not taking in any further information than that anymore, which is the same thing as it happens with any of these other cult of personalities. So even though his cult of personality may, may be around a, a personality that delivers slightly more truth than some of the ones we've been presented in the past, because at this point that's necessary, it's still just slightly more truth. So right. here's, a, here's the problem. And this, this is academics coming onto a scene that largely had eschewed formal academia, that being the alternative media. I mean, we kind of looked at that, we used it, but most of our gurus in the movement at one point were not out of that academic background. And what academics bring to anything is a structure. And it's a structure then that can play off of the dialectic. And I see somebody like Jordan Peterson, who has counterparts out there in the culture, but he seems to actually be able to dance on the edge of subject matter sometimes. Except with the JQ. He will always yeah. shut the JQ down. But yeah. Hands down. Slam the door shut. Right. I actually I actually listened to him answer the jq question and sort of it took him a long time to answer it the other day like i don't the video is from a couple of months back but it's a smaller thing that hasn't been seen a lot and i'll see if i can find it i'll send it to you it was kind of he he, he gave an explanation that on one level sounds reasonable but he failed to address like really probably the emotion behind the question right so he was basically talking about well sure jews are you know like in more, more positions of power and authority and that that's because of their placement on the competency hierarchy right because they have higher iqs wouldn't you want people with higher iqs ashkenazi jews on average have you know one standard deviation higher uh, in iq so wouldn't you want those people in positions of power right so like on one level that makes sense but on another level he didn't he didn't in any way address the idea that they're doing things in the world that a lot of people find offensive, harmful, or not for their best interest, right? He didn't address that part of it. So it was kind of interesting. I'll send you the video, but he did do more of addressing the JQ and he even addressed the reason why he didn't address it when he was initially asked it. But it was kind of that interesting thing you said, Randy, that dancing, like everybody who was there probably feels like they got their question answered. And I just, mm -hmm. you know, be, be, being how I am with this kind of stuff, I'm like, well, you did. You answered all of, like, the apparent points, but you didn't actually address the sentiment behind the question, you know? Right, right. Well, he can't do it because that'll kill him professionally. Yeah. Right, he won't. Exactly. I mean, he just, I mean, he's too smart to get that or to not do and that. And that's what you see even in the, in the alternative media a lot. I mean, we're still getting that. And it's not like... It's not like we got to slam Jews all the time. It's not like everything's about Zionism or Israel. But you do have to wonder in a time when we're finding out now that school teachers are being fired in Texas, yeah. I think, for not taking... Yeah, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a... Uh, yeah. An oath of field. Uh, well, and, and remember, that was a whole thing last year with putting out relief funds pathology. for Hurricane Harvey. You couldn't get the relief right. funds unless you signed that. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. The speech pathologist, right? Yeah, the, the Muslim speech speech pathologist. Like, like, yeah. like, you know, trying to, you know, give voice to something. She was pa she was Palestinian. That's she Palestinian born in Austria. Right. Yeah. So there you yeah, have right. it. And, and Randy, to your point, the you know, the BDS movement has been encountering extreme sort of blowback from yep. hardcore Zionist organizations, yep. and groups all across campuses around the country. Yep. And so Zionism has been in a fervent sort of attempt to rebrand itself uh -huh. over the last three years. It come into this fusion with nationalism. Yep. So that if you're going to be a nationalist, you're almost a de facto Zionist, you know, by default. And Rand, that gets back to what Randy was saying earlier about, you know, you choosing a side or choosing a team. And you get a guy like Tommy Robinson who's, you know, another guy who was big in, in 2018. And Tommy Robinson, of course, is, you know, out there trying to bust the gang grooming and all that stuff in London. And, you know, and on paper, it sounds great, right? But then you go in and you find out that, you know, what he did was essentially break the law and he was told not to do it. And he did it anyway. He's got a history of doing this. And then you go in to look at his background and who's kind of behind him and, 
this travels to Israel, and you know, all of a sudden now, you know, Tommy Robinson's. It a doesn't seem guy. organic anymore. Yeah. And, but now we're championing him as 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 a a a, a you're kind of a Paul a of free speech, yeah. right? So now we've got free speech and Zionism tied together. Uh, it's it's like this weird thing that's been going on, and I think it's clearly been deliberate. And they've got people out there who are tasked with this role. People like Jack Kosobiak, Mike Cernovich, uh-huh. Laura Loomer, yep. Tommy Robinson. Their role is to rebrand this thing yeah. so that people can buy into it from a place of nationalism. I, I, and even, I, even Alex Jones. That's always been Alex Jones's task. Alex, Alex has been accused of that for an incredibly long time. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, exactly. become, and it's become more and more obvious and apparent, you know, like, we're, we're, is it, this is my question. Does Alex Jones even talk about conspiracy anymore at all? I haven't listened to him in a long time. Is, I, 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 I mean, I haven't listened in a really long time either, but like sometimes clips show up in your YouTube feed, right? I can't, I've not heard him say anything about anything related to any kind of conspiracy, be it a political or social or even like GMO stuff or chemtrails. I haven't, it, like, it is literally like, all Trump all the time. It's like the 24 hour Trump news network, right? He gets into the 5G control grid stuff a lot. Oh, he yeah. does still? Okay. Yeah, I haven't he heard him talk about that. And okay. actually, that's where he's the most effective. He's always been the most effective at that stuff. He should when be out, doing when that. When he gets into that territory, he's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And he knows chapter and verse and can spit it you, you know, real, in a real, really coherent fashion. But at, since we're on the subject, Alex Jones is the symbol of the fall of alt media. Uh-huh. Yeah. Exactly. And this was his year to fall. I mean, look yeah. how he got, he basically got deep, deplatformed everywhere. He got taken down on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, demonetized his channel. Um, YouTube deleted his channel. They didn't they just deleted, demonetize yeah. it, they deleted, they deleted it. Deleted it. I think yeah. PayPal, I think he got back to PayPal, didn't he? Didn't he see PayPal? And if, I think I he, might, he might be back with, but, but yeah, I mean, Everything for, for Alex Jones really started in 20, uh, 2017. And it, I think the, the start of his fall was when he was really up to his eyeballs in Pizzagate. Right. And that guy showed up, you know, at uh, Comet Ping Pong, who I think was a total fake. Total, yeah. Plan, total yeah. patsy. Yep. Goes in there, you know, it's a totally controlled situation. And and now it all points back to Jones, and people you know could have gotten hurt or I don't you know the, there's that whole there's that whole ruse that goes on, and then you have this so-called lawyer who was there that day, traveled from New Jersey to uh, or Philly to to Comet Ping Pong with his family, a theoretical witness, gets on Alex Jones' show and calls him out, and it's the first time I ever saw Alex Jones walk something back. And it was pathetic. It was absolutely pathetic. And I'm like, this is okay. This is really something to keep your eye out on because I think this is we're going to witness the end of Alex Jones. And it just kept coming, lawsuit after lawsuit. Yeah. He's got Sandy Hook right and yeah, right. And yeah. so bringing this back to astrology, which is what we talked about at one point, was his. He's a he's an Aquarian, and in 2018 we had the South Node in Aquarius, which is all about you know, mass media, alt media, uh, it has to do with um, kind of radicalism, revolutionary thought, free speech. You know, these are all Aquarian kinds of yeah. attitudes and beliefs. And they all just kind of went down in flames. Alex Jones became the scapegoat. You know, he became the scapegoat for all of it. Which was always the plan. I think so. I think no, so. it is actually. And I was going to say that the parallel here is interesting. Think about the 1960s love and peace hippie movement and what that was in an organic form. And then what happened is that moved centrist into a media darling. And then by the end of the 60s, going into 1970, with cascading events, you have the takedown of that movement, the Audemont, uh, the Patty Hearst thing, the arrest of Jerry Rubin, uh, John Sinclair gets taken down. You begin to see the main figures in a movement taken down or, or devalued in some way. Right. But that still moves. That was a, that was a platform to, to bring 
things into the culture and then they do a discard on it. They discard key characters. They See, this isn't worth paying attention to. Aspects. See, we look, yeah. See, that's we look what at I was, it. Yeah. That's what I was talking about, the academics in this, because that's what, again, the academics do. They're very good at giving structure to something and then shuffling the deck on that structure to discard what is not useful to the dominant agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, right. that's a lot of what we're seeing right now in, in, in this universe of alternative media, which at one point burgeoningly was looking like it could have subsumed mainstream media. I mean, given this year how we've seen uh, major network platforms begin to tank financially and how major media figures have been taken out as well. But what's happening is now, I think there's an emergence going on and I think there's a control grid. And this is gonna go into some things that we wanna talk about as we go down the road on this, of what's, what's gonna happen to this platform that we're talking about. Because mm -hmm. you know, being yeah. deplatformed is, is a reality now. So, so, so Randy, I, I really wanted to speak to what you just brought up about the 60s, you know, the limited hang in the 60s. Yeah. I believe if you, if you drill down and look it up, it's called Operation Chaos, mm -hmm. uh -huh. right? And Operation Chaos, they shut everything down. But then what you have, to your point is you go from these kind of radical figureheads and then all of a, and then they, you know, either get subsumed or taken out or whatever, whatever. Right. And then you have, uh, Rob, uh, Rob Reiner's character right. showing up on all, all the family. All the family day, yeah. Right. Who is the epitome of the sixties. And now he's on a sitcom and now he's, he's infiltrated middle America. And he's yeah. infiltrated the caricaturized version of middle America. Right. So that's that's one symbol to what you're talking about. And I think what's really interesting currently on the alt media side is the uh, what I would call the growth in uh, the evolution of Tucker Carlson. Uh -huh. And Tucker Carlson is somebody who I could not stand during the 90s. I love him now. <laughs> but now Tucker Carlson yeah. has evolved into somebody who I think is quite interesting uh -huh. in a lot of ways. And one of the things that you know, we witness all the time when somebody makes a, a comment and the comment might be politically incorrect is that within 48 hours, they're doing the walk back. And Tucker Carlson talked about what, you know, whatever your view is on immigration, he said that immigration, illegal immigration makes this country dirtier and poorer. And as a result of that, he lost 14 sponsors. And he did not walk any of that back. Uh -huh. Now, maybe it's because Fox says, don't worry about it. We got your back. You got great ratings. People are going to be with you. But there's something about Tucker Carlson that's quite interesting. Uh -huh. and, and I feel like if we could look at, say, the kind of co-opted version of the radical 60s that were shut down as personified by the emergence of Rob Reiner's character and all the family, I would say that the inverse of that would be Tucker Carlson, you know, showing up every night and he's not perfect. He's not complete, but he gets, he gets about as close to it as he possibly can. Well, Tucker Carlson is very, Tucker Carlson is very dangerous because he's one of the few people who will criticize the right, who holds a lot of conservative you know, ideals and values, but also has some very liberal ones and is sort of open to discussion, is very open to having people on his show who he disagrees with and who is able to discuss all this in like a comical way. And, you know, he's also, it, it, he's, he's, he's belligerent in a way that is comical because he asks a very simple question and 90% of his guests cannot answer the question and he just keeps asking the question and they'll say everything else but answering the question and, and that just sort of paints a very clear picture without him ever having to say anything that offensive of what the problem is here and, and he's, you know, he's really starting to, um, I know a lot of people, like, you know, my dad does not like Tucker Carlson but he actually the other, uh, like a week or two ago, there was an article where he, there was something Tark, Tucker Carlson was saying that he liked and appreciated. And so he shared the article with me. And I was like, wow, just two weeks before that, I had told my dad I love Tucker Carlson. And he told me I was ridiculous. And now suddenly he's sending me something because Tucker Carlson is actually saying things that make sense. And if you're a person that honors, you know, sensible ideas at all, then you have to say that at least this person is, is, is presenting that, right? <laughs> right. So now we have Tucker Carlson and we have Jordan Peterson. 
now we're starting to see kind of a, a roster assemble, you know, mm -hmm. of people that, you know, get to the truth, approximate the truth, stand in some version of the truth. And I feel like that this is kind of the, the outgrowth of, of the death of the alt media. It's this uh -huh. co-optation yeah. for better or worse, where this, there's this kind of, you know, you know, kind of, um, you, you digestion of ideas at, at kind of a, you know, mainstream level. Right. And, and I feel like that's where it's going. You know, so it's a synthesis that mainstream has realized that if they're going to hold any validity, they're going to have to present some characters that are at least a little bit controversial and speak a little bit of truth. And so then people will be satisfied with that and won't go digging any. Well, that's any the further. process. I mean, right, that's the yeah. dialectic process. It's the Hegelian yes, dialectic. I mean, right. with that. Yeah. You yeah. know, so all of it feels to me kind of external at this point. And I think that's why a lot of us have shut down on what we watch and what we consume. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm watching and following virtually no one at this point. Now, I say that facetiously because I do, but it's not like I'm compelled to share. It's not like I'm compelled to absorb a lot of what I, I see out there. If anything, what I'm seeing right now is forcing me to go back into my well inside and begin to deal with this gestalt around us kind of on the internalized level, which is the place where we do all the shadow work and stuff. So I, I think it's an interesting process. I think the danger is overtly externalizing everything and assigning too much value to media figures uh -huh. on any level. Yep. I mean, you know, that's why I've said for years to people, shut it down once in a while. That includes this, but just turn it off and go, quiet and deep for a while yeah you know it reminds me of the process of uh it's a creative process in a lot of ways uh -huh. mm -hmm. and uh, you know if a if a a band remember bands there used to be bands <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you know? yeah um, i do yeah. yeah yeah if a band was together um you know they would have a period of time where they'd have a fair amount of material they'd worked on they'd have a first record and it could be really interesting or good, right? And then the second record comes it's off more slow. Yeah. You know, it's the yeah. hardest to make. And um, some bands don't ever get past it when they do. You know, they, now they're dealing with the third record. And the third record is an interesting record because, you know, it takes kind of a reboot with the third record mm -hmm. because the second record is almost always a reaction to success. Uh -huh. pressure or whatever right and then the third record really takes some going within and you have to you have to drop off the map sometimes for a little bit you know brian wilson got off the bus you know whatever you think of brian wilson yeah. right he got off the bus and he said i gotta get off the bus and i gotta go hang out while you guys are on the road getting laid and you know i'm gonna take acid and i'm gonna hang out with phil Spector's guys and I'm going to work on my ideas. And it feels like we're at a point in time now where it's very tough with social media because there's such a demand to create content yep, and to stay relevant and to stay yeah. current. Yeah, go there, man. And to keep yeah. the conversation going about your content and to all that stuff, right? That's right, because there are people that want it. There are still people that are really hungry. And the challenge is having that downtime so you can deepen your roots, uh -huh. you know, have more resonance, have more soul, have more spirit, have more creativity without just, you know, having everybody go run over here to the next, you know, uh -huh. thing for however long that thing lasts, right? Yeah. And so we're in this cycle where as content creators, I think it could be fairly exhausting. Totally. Because we have our own inner demands. We have external demands, which you talk about, Randy, or I've talked about. And then we have... And I think all three of us on some level and a lot of people in this world, I mean, ultimately, I think we're creative types, which is why we do what we do. And creative types need downtime in order to gestate and come up with new things. Yeah. Or else we're just, you know, we're, we're just commodities. That's all. Yeah. And, and, this, and this medium, unfortunately, has been a commodity. And I'll say one more thing. And I'll toss back to you guys. I'm going to want to talk about this for the last 20 minutes. You know, and we can get into dark journalists because I feel like we're going to go there eventually. But so, dark, you know, people know about dark journalists. And Randy, 
you've done some, you know, really, really great work, you know, kind of cracking that code open. And, and, I, and you know, just, just cruising around the web, I, I found this show called, what, what is it? Um, it's, it's like this new show, like, a, you know, a quest for truth, or it's this guy that looks just like the dark journalist. Mm -hmm. And he, I think he's from Belgium or someplace like that. And he's running around talking. I mean, I don't know how he's getting these people, but he's, he's flying all over the world. He's talking to John Lear. He's talk, he, you know, he's talking to you know all these sort of esoteric insiders. And it's just so weird that he's like this doppelganger, you know, for for JD, right? Or DJ. You know, it's just weird. And it's like this is the kind of world, you know, that we're living in now. It's like, you know, and not even that DJ is the Beatles. But it's like, let's say he was, well, this guy's the monkeys, you know, it just, it's showing up now in this strange kind of doppelganger ass kind of way where it's not even like really original people are like copying each other's facial looks. It's so weird. I mean, yeah. that's kind of where alternative media is now. Wow. On yeah. one level. It's formula. And basically, you know, regardless of what you think, I don't really want to talk about the dark journalist. I'm grateful to our mutual friend, Marit, who brought forward that information and sat down with me and we unpacked it. Having said that, my biggest problem with specifically dark journalists, but other people out there in the media, and it's in layers, is that I've long suspected, and I keep getting confirmation hits, not bias, hits, that this media was sewn into decades ago, which I, I think Bill Cooper did a fair job of warning us about that with Alex. And I, I, having been on platforms in alternative media now for, this will be 15 years. God, that's scary. Um, I've seen people emerge that later on, when you go back and you look at their background, you come to realize like Jordan Peterson, Oh, wait a minute. You have a background with um, a university, with some UN organization, you have attachments to some society, some religious order, and you begin to discover that the superficial level at which they put out material is connected to a deeper root, and that this is a filtration process, which you were talking about, you know, uh, revelation of the method this isn't so much revelation of the method as filtering out and therefore transposing the conversations that occurred in an unfiltered media. And see, the problem is that now it's not an unfiltered media anymore and the controllers have stepped in and they haven't just stepped in, we stepped into them, which kind of brings the conversation to we're forced now to deal with platforms like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook that are used to promote or even to produce shows on these platforms. And then the monetization side of it, which largely goes back to two key players, Stripe and PayPal. And Emily and I talked about this before we hooked up with you this morning about what's going on. This is on. where I want to go in the next segment. Yeah. In the next, yeah. yeah. So I'll, let's, I'll... let's drop that. This is, this kind of is a great place to, to drop this segment and go over onto the Patreon side. So um, thank you guys out there on uh, all the platforms this year for um, supporting, listening, watching, uh, feeling comfortable enough to complain when you didn't like what you heard and complimenting us when you did. <laughs> And um, for some of you who migrated over to the pace side, uh, we thank you and hopefully you'll join us. We're not asking for a lot of money. We just want the support and we want to feel like we're part of a creative family. So thanks to Robert Phoenix for joining us on this segment. And as always, Emily Moyer for being Emily Moyer. And <laughs> And I just want to thank everybody. I want to say thank you also to all of our, our listeners and, and patrons, also to all the people we've had on the show as, as yes. guests, the people who stepped in and helped me with guest co-hosting. Well, you know, while Randy took some time off this year, I want to thank my good friends, Jeff Gates, Nish, Danny Katz, um, you know, for, for and Robert Phoenix, who helped with that. Robert, I want to thank you also for appearing so many times on this show. And I also love doing our new show, which is also here on Off Planet Media. 
A big thank you also to Danny Katz, who is a big contributor to, uh, to Off Planet Media and the show that I do with her. And, you know, just all, all, a lot of the listeners out there who provide an extra level of emotional and financial support. And um, thank you to, to Randy's wife, Debbie, and to the special people in my life who support me on a day-to-day -day basis of some of the, some of the struggles that, that go on for me in the background. Uh, we love all of you, and we're very, very appreciative, and we're very lucky to be able to do what we do to, have, to get here and talk about what's on our mind and have people be interested in it. So thank you very much, and um, we wish you all the best in the new year. Yeah, Robert, you like to say? Yeah, all that, all that and uh, you know, more for me. I just want to thank you guys for having me on as frequently as you do because i really enjoy hanging out with you and i think we got a good mind meld and, and i know that you know there's a lot of um migration between you know my world and your worlds and yep. you know and i think i think you know between the three of us we've created kind of a you know nice little synergy and a group of people that have tended to trust us and be a part of our worlds and not always in in you know clear and uh, you know, kind of definite or finite fashion, they're out there. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be connected to, you know, to all of you through this. And, um, you know, and I hope that we can continue to grow that, you know, through the coming year and create more community. And at some point, you know, bring this out of the virtual and into the real so we can all do something together. Because I think yeah. this is kind of the year, I think, to do that. So yeah. maybe, you know, maybe we can explore that further on as we move into this world in yeah. 2019. All of that and more um, coming up in 2019. The ante room to 2020 this year is going to be steep. This is the big step up and mm -hmm. a lot of change is coming. We'll cover it all in this year. We love you guys. The truth is out there. It's inside you. And uh, step over to Patreon if you want to see the other part of this. We'll be back with another show next year. So I just hit pause and you